Welcome to ASRS's Journal of Vitriol Diseases Authors Forum. I'm your host, Dr. Timothy Murray, Editor-in-Chief of JVRD. On each episode of the JVRD Authors Forum, I will interview innovative retinal researchers on their studies featured only in JVRD and how these studies will impact our patients' care in our clinics. Tune in to hear directly from investigators about the clinical implications of the newest and highest quality research in the field of retina. Welcome to JVRD's Authors Forum podcast. It's my pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Cleo Armitage Harper III from Austin Retina Associates with improvements in cystoid macular edema secondary to systemic bevacizumab in a patient with Coates Plus Syndrome. Welcome, Army. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm honored to be here with you all today. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here, and, and it's kind of a fascinating presentation. Could you take me through this case a little bit and then look at it? It's a really difficult case. This little girl presented when she was two with exotropia in her right eye, and we found, you know, vitreous hemorrhage in a falciform fold, and, um, you know, my greatest assumption was that it was, it was a fever. And so we did the regular panel invitae and, you know, the four genes we look for usually didn't come up. And of course there's more. So with it, we don't check. So I assumed it was fever and then kind of followed her along and she didn't have anything really systemically uh, that we could find um, at that time. And as we followed her, you know, I did uh, ended up doing flourishing angiogram after at age three and I lasered the left eye because it was, you know, severely avascular. And what happened is, is that I kept noticing that the avascularity kept shrinking back towards the macula. And it was really unusual because we can have progression of fever, but it was an unusual presentation. And I kept lasering and kept lasering. And I was pretty close, you know, to the point where I was extending into the macula. I'm like, this is just not right. And then, you know, she developed, started to develop some other symptoms. She had bleeding in her colon and her gastrointestinal system, and she got severely anemic. Um, and at the same time, she was developing cystoid macular edema. And so we ran a full genome panel and found that she had the bilillic um, ST1, ST, STN1 uh, genes, which is that whole complex that inhibits telomeres from growing and and, uh, and it also um, has some problems with DNA replication. I don't think we really understand what it is, but that was diagnosed with Coates Plus in addition to our other findings, which included some cerebral calcifications and, and things like that. And so I was injecting her in the office about every four to six weeks, starting at age seven. Um, it's hard to inject kids because they don't have funding for it. So we were using the things that we had, which was ILEA, and injecting this little seven-year-old every six weeks. And finally, her anemia was so severe and her GI bleeding was so severe, they decided to put her on a, a vastin systemically, bevacizumab, because that has been shown, just shown some promise with Coates Plus for the systemic symptoms. And then I noticed I didn't have to inject any more at all. And I thought about Rosenbaum and going back to how it all started, and it, and it took me there. What's interesting, I think there's a lot of important things that you just discussed already. One, you know, I think people forget that our intravitreal use of bevacizumab was after Dr. Rosenfeld um, and Dr. Pugliofito used IV bevacizumab. Um, and, and showed a proof of concept response in the eye. So I think that's fascinating. The other thing I love, Armi, is you went back at the beginning um, and you exhaustively evaluated your patients. So you went to the operating room for EUA, you did, you did fluorescein angiography. I think one of the things that I always like to remind people of is that wide field fluorescein in an atypical childhood vascular disease can be incredibly helpful. As you, as you have, have said, and also looking at the second eye and sometimes looking at the family. So all of those could, could, play, could, could play a start. 
you went to laser first. Did you use a combination later of laser and an anti-VEGF or did you stay with laser through the course? So, no, I, I did kind of both. I didn't do them at the same time because, you know, when you laser and you use intravipural anti-VEGF, it does egress or into the systemic circulation much more readily if you're doing laser. So I would pause a week or two in between and kind of move back and forth. But as that, you know, avascular retina kept progressing, that was the scary part for me. And this is one of those cases that you just, it's one of those things where you're, okay, am I doing the right thing for this child? And, you know, you and I've been doing this a super long time. And there's still things that I see that I'm like, am I doing the, the right thing for this child? And Luckily, her vision, at least in the left eye, was preserved for a long time. It also brings to, to mind the case that uh, I think Jonathan Sears had in a younger patient that was actually diagnosed in the NICU at 35 weeks because it was a baby that was being screened for ROP anyway. And so this is something we have to think about for universal screening because had we had this child much earlier, the outcome in the right eye might have been substantially different, which I think is super interesting. Well, you know, within the, the the subset of those of us looking, you know, in a very focused way at pediatric retinal diseases, I think um, Jonathan, yourself, um, Nina Barakal also looking at extended telomeric syndrome with, with Coates Plus and, and the Roper overlap. So, you know, I, I think what we're realizing is that we may have included a lot of diseases under um, an umbrella where, where we really need to be able to separate to understand that pathophysiology better. Yeah, and I think you're exactly right. And a lot of times, you know, we will see asymmetric ROP and we're wondering, you know, there's some fever component, there's something else here besides the roper that you like, the roper that you spoke of that Nina's written about. And that's something I always pay attention to. And I have several patients where we've diagnosed that where it just didn't make a lot of sense. So if it looks anomalous and, you know, we're seeing 500 babies a month, right. then it probably is. So it's something you're else you're looking for. So it's, it's just keeping your mind open. I think genetic testing is the future and genomic therapy is the future. So that's always in the back of my mind, too. And the other thing that you alluded to is you did a targeted gene screening initially and and didn't get what you thought you would see. There, It was not the result you were expecting. When that happens, that really makes me think whole genome screening or I need to think about something else or what other tests do I need to do to move me in the in the right direction for this child. So I do think with these kids, you have to be able to recognize when it's not what you think it should be. Exactly. And I think that I was slow to come to that, slower than I would have liked, honestly. But I think that's part of the lesson here in this paper. And that's why we really run to present it, besides the fact that the systemic anti-VEGF was very successful in treating her macular edema. But you're exactly right. You got to think outside the box a little bit and don't get focused in. Just because that first panel is negative, it doesn't mean that you're done. And I think that we're learning more about that. And now, you know, the residents and the fellows are being, you know, more well-versed in genetics than we ever were when we were going through training. You know, and the other thing I think that's important is that that at least for for our practice where there are these complex diseases, remembering how important going to the OR for an examination under anesthesia for a child that's out of the NICU. I think we can do amazing exams for these very, you know, small preemies because we can control the whole exam. But then you hit that age and if you don't go to the OR, you're never getting the kind of exam that you want. And then the understanding of wide field documentation and ultra wide field fluorescein. I, I think those have been game changers over time in, in this complex pediatric you know, focus. And I think it's super important of what you just said and understanding that it's, it's a fairly easy procedure for us because the baby's asleep. The fluorescein is non-toxic at 7.7 .7 milligrams per kilo. Um, and the anesthesia for us, even with a laser, takes about 30 minutes or less. Right. So it's a very short amount of anesthesia that these kids get. And so I'm very confident with my you know, anesthesiologist friends that, that, that this is the right thing to do for these children to seek. You know, and we have patients that will come in with other diseases, and we're not sure why they're not seeing. And a lot of times, that's where I see what's going on in the OR. 
So it's, it's super important. Yeah, I think that's really part of the spectrum of, of focus is, you know, you and I both know that you've got to see it to understand it. You can even see it and not understand it. But if you don't see it, you're never going to have an idea of what you're dealing with. So low threshold with atypical disease or children with, with a younger age that cannot get a complete exam. In the office, the, one of the big things for us have been, has been optos imaging. That's been hugely yes. helpful. And yes, that's, that's changed how often I have personally had to go to the OR with some of these kids. But having said that, I, the OR with an EUA is the gold standard for all of us. And this is a fascinating case, taking us right back, Harmony, to, to what got us to use anti-VEGF in the eye um, by starting with systemic delivery. So I thought this was incredibly well written. You have um, nice imaging for this case and the discussion is, is robust. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Army Harper, for joining us to talk about this fascinating case. Thank you so much, Tim. And again, honored to be here. Thanks for tuning in to the JVRD Authors Forum. You can watch and listen to more episodes on the ASRS YouTube channel and on popular podcast directories, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Visit www.asrs.org forward slash JVRD forum on the ASRS website to learn more. See you soon.